So uh, I want to talk about my very close relationship with my DVR and Verizon Fios. Um, we've become very close over the, over the last couple of months. I switched over from cable. If you use Time Warner, you're losers. I'm telling you, Fios is amazing. I think I spend more time with Fios when I was in South Africa than I did with my staff. <laughs> it's okay. Um, just kidding. I didn't. I did not. You know, the cool thing about Fios is that you can actually record shows at an airport if you have online access. So when I was coming back from South Africa, the first Miami Heat game to Boston, which they lost, they keep losing. Lord, help them. And, and um, I, I don't want Kobe to win another ring because people are going to like come to my face, and I, I really don't like that. <laughs> so, um, But anyway, they lost the game. I was recording it from the airport. I went home and watched it. it was a, it's amazing. I mean, literally, this is my best friend. I mean, really, I mean, it, it's amazing, except when my DVR records a rerun. I have my shows, How I Met Your Mother, um, Big Bang Theory is one of my favorites now. It's a hilarious show. Uh, but when it doesn't say new, and you know, you're in the middle of watching the show and you're like all excited because you waited the whole week, and it's a rerun. But do you watch it? Yeah. And you're like, ah, you know, courtesy laugh, and you're just watching it, and you know, it, it's boring, but you watch it. And I think that's a good example, ironically, most of our lives are like reruns. We're supposed to be advancing and you know, experiencing fun stories, new stories. But a lot of us get stuck at a rerun. Same issues, same problems, the same stuff. Over and over, over again, year after year. And, and the truth is, what God wants for us is to experience life to the full. But the problem is not God. The problem is not anybody else. The problem is who? It's us. We want life, but we can't seem to get unstuck from these tendencies, from these things that we struggle with. And if you want to really specifically bring into focus, we continually struggle with the problem of going back to the same old things that we thought we dealt with already. You know, the Bible puts it like this. The Bible says that um, like a dog returns to its vomit, a fool, what, returns to its... How many fools do we have in this room? <laughs> People are like, I'm, I'm awesome. No, you're not. I mean, the truth is there's something in humanity we don't know why, there's something in us, there's a problem, there's a deep struggle in us that makes us continually struggle with relapses, go back to the things that take away from our life, not advance our life, over and over again. And it points to the reality that change is impossible apart from a new type of redemption. The author, whoever wrote that story, has to come in and kill somebody off or redeem us or we're never going to get free. We're never going to get unstuck from this situation. And Starbeth read it for us. It's a mirror of Exodus 16. When you read, when you read Exodus, actually when you read the whole Bible, the whole Old Testament, you're going to be like, this is a rerun. And you know, a lot of people tell me, aren't these, aren't these, don't, don't these people get it? Because Exodus 15 and Exodus 16 look exactly alike. Again, they're turning away from God. Again, the key word is what? Grumbling. Didn't they just grumble on Exodus 15? Now they're grumbling. Now they have water. Now they want food. <coughs> they want meat. So they grumble. Turn away from God again. Before it was worship, five seconds. Now it's grumbling again. God, you have no idea what you're doing. You don't know how to lead my life. Why, 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 why? It's a rerun. So the question is, how can God come, how does the gospel, how does Jesus come into our life and save us from a rerun, from the reruns of our lives? Because I don't know about you, 
But either if I continue to live these reruns over, the, either the power of repetition is going to kill me or just boredom is going to kill me. And today, what we're going to unpack is how we get unstuck, how the gospel helps us get unstuck from this annoying rerun in our life over and over again. So let's unpack it, Exodus 16, and pay attention to how Moses writes this. And he's very specific. He's very, um, actually, mathematical here. He counts the days when he writes this. And watch this. He says what? He says, in the 15th day, 1-5, in the 15th day of the second month. Now, why does Moses write that? He's trying to give you the approximate time since they were liberated from slavery and oppression. So Moses is saying just 15 days of the second month. So a very short amount of time. After they had come out of Egypt in the desert, right, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we we had died by the Lord's hands in Egypt. Exclamation point, right? Egypt! They were salt. They, they, uh, there we sat around, pots of meat and all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to what? To death. There you go again. Another rerun. Another complaint. Worship, one second. Self-centeredness. The next, right? You look at this, and they're complaining about food. And you look at this passage and be like, "Man, these people don't get it." And I, I have to be honest with you, like vulnerable. I complain about food every day. I, mean, I don't know about you guys, but me, my my wife hates asking me, "What do you want to eat?" You know. Or if she cooks me something, you like it? Really? Yeah, I love this. <laughs> and she goes, you're lying. <laughs> because when you like something, you praise it, you know? I mean, I have this, this I mean, honestly, to tell you, like, the human issue of grumbling, of, of just basic necessities, we want the quality of these basic necessities to be amazing because that's part of the rerun of self-centeredness of narcissism, of entitlement, the, all those cousins, all those issues. We, we Somehow humanity always finds themselves in, in the story of putting their issues or themselves in the epicenter of the universe. Like this food is all that's going on in the earth or the universe. Like we're the most, what we eat is the most important thing, even though I do this. So I identify with the people that's grumbling. So if the, if Moses is, you know, the people are grumbling against Moses, I'm grumbling against my wife, right? I'm grumbling, I'm grumbling against when I'm in the diner. This is not, this is not rare enough. This is not well cooked enough. I, I mean, big, if I really think about it, if I, if I thought logically about it in, in a diner and not, I didn't get angry, didn't have to, because really it's not a big deal. So we have this tendency, like these people, to make big deals of things that's really nothing. You know what I'm saying? And we do, most of our life, you see the motif of Exodus 16, that these people who've been delivered by a great God, been delivered by a father that loves them, that if he was impatient with them, would have killed them, because I would have killed them. I would have killed me. And they were slaves, now they're complaining about what they eat, what they drink, blah, 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 you know, too bougie. And, and so God's grace, is, you see the God's grace here, but you see them always make the mistake, always do the rerun of making something that's nothing big. I mean, I hate when this happens. I remember people, you know, like to make things something that's nothing. You know those people? They come to you and they'd be like, they're like, Pastor Sam, you got to try. You got to try Shake Shack. 
it is amazing. It's the best burger in New York City. And I go, yeah, let's go. First time I went, two hour wait. I was like, this can cure narcissism in city. A city of narcissism, Shake Shack can cure narcissism. It's not about you. You have to wait two hours to eat a hamburger? Are you kidding? It's, person, it's, it's that good. And I'm like, well, you better be that good. I'm gonna kill you right after this. <laughs> I'm gonna shoot you. And we're waiting, 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 you know, really, I, we're, we're sitting in line, going through all this trouble. I try to pay somebody in front of the line 20 bucks, and they looked at me like I was stupid, you know? And then I was waiting a lot, two hours passes by. We get the burger. I eat the burger. And I, I almost threw the burger at this person. <laughs> I said, dude, listen, I ate In N Out. <laughs> now, In N Out is the best burger in the universe. This is mediocre at best. You made me wait two hours. Two hours of my life you wasted. And if I would have wasted my life happily for something that's worth it, this is definitely not worth it. Definitely, because I didn't eat the shroom burger. Shroom burger is kind of worth it sometimes. <laughs> you know, but it was just a regular burger, you know, and I was just upset. Because someone made something out of nothing. If you want to know where Jesus is in this chapter, Exodus 16, if you want to know where Jesus is, and these annoying reruns of our life. What he's trying to save us from, what the gospel is trying to save humanity from, is very simple. This is the first lesson we learned. Jesus is trying to help us, not to waste our life, but don't make nothing, some, not something, some. I'm serious, don't make nothing, some. The people of God, Make nothing, something. When we continue to make big things that are not, and complain, I mean, if you know complainers, their lives are filled with complaint of how the, of how the small things in their life, it's not to part to what they want, but you're wasting your life. You're wasting your life on nothing. It's not even worth talking about. That's why after Shake Shack, I stopped complaining and I punched them. You know, I just stopped talking about it and moved on and said, I can't wait to go to In and Out. But the truth is, if you look at your life right now, if we look at our life, listen, it, oh, we, we come back. We're just like these people. We come back to this rerun of self centeredness, of entitlement and narcissism in our life. We come back. Something is not up to par. These small issues, these small things in our lives. And we make them bigger. And the problem is this. We make them bigger than God. We complain to God. God, why can't you fix this? Why can't you fix that? Like that problem is the epicenter of the universe. Like that is the most important thing in life. And most of our life, the tragic thing is, most of our life, most Christians or non-Christians, doesn't matter who you are. When they die, their life will just be full of complaint. Nothing more. That's a tragedy to waste our life making something and nothing. So let me ask you a question, okay? Look into your life. Whatever issues, whatever areas in your life that you have right now and you're doing the same thing, look in, use, let's use this as a mirror to our life and be like, oh, I'm making big of my needs or my issues or my problems so big, but they're not that big. They're not in the center of the universe. Do you know who's in the center of the universe? You're like, hmm. do I need to ask the astrophysicist? Who's in the center of the universe? God. People are like, people tell me, they come to me, Pastor Sam, I just learned that God is in control. <laughs> what do you mean? I feel the peace that God is in control. He just took over my situation. I'm like, look at, listen, you idiot. God was already in control. You just found out. Or, or I just, I'm amazed when people come to me, God is so good, Pastor Sam. I'm like, why? 
because he moved in my life. Let me just tell you, God was always awesome. <laughs> like, you didn't have to experience it. God stays like this, and he's just sexy. <laughs> All right? He doesn't need to flex. He just is. He is awesome. God is, right now, at the epicenter of the universe, as awesome. That's his ontology. It's not something that someone has to experience. Now, when you do experience it, it can change your life. But the fact is, most of the time we make these little things bigger than, the, than who is awesome already. Because if you look at the story, let's go down. God is awesome. God doesn't kill them. God gives them, in Exodus 16, bread from heaven. It's, it's like waffles. Really, if you read it, it's like waffles and ice cream. White wafers. It's like, really, a little waffle house. God created a Waffle House in the desert. He's awesome. Okay? All right? And quail is like, you know, it's chicken. Waffles and chicken, come on. That's like a great restaurant to open up. I mean, God is awesome. And, and these people's complaining about their little issues. God did that. Why did he do that? Not because those people were awesome. They were pathetic because God was awesome. God was a father. God loved them. God wanted to teach them and save them from this stupid thing they're struggling with that they could not see. They weren't given vision. Now that's why the gospel is good news, people. The gospel wants to save our, save our life from wasting it on making nothing something. When you look at this passage, look what happens. Right? Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down some bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for the day, right? Now watch this. However, of course, people are stupid. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. Like some of us will not pay attention to what's being said in this passage. Don't do that. They kept part of it until the morning. But it was full of maggots. How many people love that? So waffles turned to maggots. I like that picture. And it began to smell. That's a great picture Moses draws there. Draws out maggots and, and it smells. It's the worst possible scenario. So Moses was angry with them. Now, here it is. Here's the issue. When you make your life, you can look at your life, look at you, and look at me. You're not that awesome, right? I mean, I'm not that awesome, well, sometimes. But I mean, seriously, you look at your life, you're not perfect, you're not awesome, you know it. It's boring to make us awesome, to boring to make us the epicenter, the central, make big of us, it's boring. And when we continue to put us to focus, our lives turn to crap. It spoils. When we take the blessings of God, all the things that God has given us, and we try to hoard it, that's what happens. Our life turns to crap. Life into, when we take life into our hands, it turns to just nothing. It's really making nothing out of something. When people ask me, about South Africa. They go, they go, Pastor Sam, how is South Africa? You know what I say when people ask me that? I get like, I'm like, I was like jet lag, I had a cold, you know, I had like stuff coming out of my nose and you know, everything, like seriously, like I was sick and I was like really messed up. And people ask, how is South Africa? And I would, I, I, I couldn't help, help myself see a picture of the beach and the mountain together, integrated in one. You guys probably saw some pictures of fake, and I was like in awe. When I saw the beach and I saw the mountain, me and, and, and Lydia came out and we were just there, we, we just, you know, saw some good looking things in our life. But when we came out there, we, we just stood still. You ever saw someone that hot before? It was, it just, you were in awe. But, but here's the point. 
It had nothing to do with me. I wasn't awesome. I was nothing compared to, to the sheer beauty of the beach and the mountain. It just was massive. It was just crazy beautiful. I almost wanted to tear. I was like, I don't know why I feel this, but this is awesome. And looking over it, I was just, wow. But it had nothing to do with me. It, it wasn't me. It was something God's created. And I think in this passage, what we need to learn from the reruns of our life how we're so powerless to change the things we can't change. It's real simple. As you need to see God here again. He comes and saves. God comes here again and delivers because he's good. You need to see that God is awesome. Amen? That's the gospel. It, it's not really complicated. And if we're going to waste our life on something, got to waste our life on something that's really worth it. So where is Jesus in our reruns? Well, lastly, we learn. Read this with me. Make big of something when it's really something. It's good advice. It's a good lesson from the passage. Because we're always, see, the problem of self-centeredness and entitlement in narcissism is the fact we keep making small things big and big things small. You see, let me tell you, addiction, relapse of sin, loss of perspective, whatever you want to call sin and whatever people might be struggling with in their life for the rest of their life, sin has one, just one is singular. With every sin involved, it's just make something small big and makes the big thing small. When we make our life big, it's sin. That's the heart of sin, to make nothing something. The heart of worship is making something, right? The real thing, something. That's the gospel. The gospel gives us a chance to waste our life on worship. Not to discover something that's never been there, but God's always been at the center. God's always been awesome. The Bible just says, the gospel just says, taste it for yourself. Experience it for yourself. And know that he is good. And praise it. Amen? That's the gospel. That's our chance today. So let's all stand. And let's do this together. Well, I hope you guys had a good Thanksgiving. One of the things that I feel like God is beginning to do at 180 is there are so many people coming to Christ. And I think that's the center of our church, you know. Over 100 people have come to Christ, come join the family of God. And a lot of you are a place where you're growing in faith, growing in God. And one of the things I feel like God is saying to a lot of us, no matter how much you love the church, no matter how much you love people, Jesus has to be in the epicenter of your life. If we lose focus on the person that saves us and the person that loves us, what is 180 about? What is the heart of 180 about? It's about Jesus Christ. If we miss Jesus, we miss 180, we miss the heart. It's be it becomes just a church. But when we make it about him, our relationship with him, making him big, we're good. But I feel like one of the things that are going to take place as we grow larger, and it's happening, is not to lose sight in the fellowship, in the worship, in just the event. But keep our heart forward, meeting Christ, encountering Christ. And I pray that would be one of our prayers today, that the centerpiece of our life would be Christ. Nothing more, nothing less.
feel like that's something that God wants to do in our life, in our church. So as we invite our friends to meet Jesus, we would continue to meet Christ. That's something I want to guard going to next year. So continue to invite friends to small groups. Continue to talk about Christ. Don't forget Christ. All right. Um, so we're going to end service today, an uh, offering. We don't collect offering during service if you're visiting. But for those of us that are members of our church, part of the church, give generously. And remember to tithe faithfully to the Lord. So let's pray together, and then uh, we'll be on our way. Father, we want to come before you today. Lord, we want to pray that, God, that you would guard our heart against missing you in any shape, any way or form. We want to be, we want to be really focused in meeting you because the church and dogma and religion cannot change our life, cannot save us. But only Christ, only the person of Jesus Christ can save us. So Lord, we want to pray that our church would remain focused on Jesus, on the person of Jesus Christ, meeting you, hearing you, and loving you. Lord, we want to thank you for the resources you've given to us. And we want to pray that we'll give faithfully so that we don't make small things big, but we make you big and your mission big. We thank you in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.